Across the Skagerrak to Oslo came the first British officers to receive the surrender of those Germans still in Norway. Obes Kasch of the Wehrmacht meets British Air Commodore Darrow. RAF meet old comrades, members of Norway's underground army. And the citizens of Oslo, as those of every other liberated country, went mad with joy to be rid at last of the German invader. Norwegian flags reappeared from every window. Until late into the night, the people danced and celebrated in the streets. Air Commodore Darrell decorates a woman patriot of Oslo. The pent-up emotions of five years now break their bounds. Norway again belongs to Norway. Norway is free. These were among the last enemy strongholds to fall to the Allies. Bremen, great German port, suffered much from bombing. In a harbor, thousands of tons of shipping were destroyed. The Europa somehow survived continuous attack, but her sister ship, the Bremen, was burned, overturned, sank. La Rochelle suffered less obvious damage, but the welcome the people gave their own French soldiers was as joyful and enthusiastic as in every town relieved from German occupation. Prisoners are brought in and any collaborators. These cars, made secretly, are brought out of hiding to join the victory parade through the town. Further north, the U-boat base of San Nazaire lies in ruins. The railway station battered, deserted. The Germans had erected concrete barriers and roadblocks. They were useless. Six-ton bombs blasted these concrete pens that could shelter 50 U-boats at a time. Now they are empty. The great garrison is captured the Germans are prisoners. Lorient, another French port, now back in French hands. But its buildings are half ruined, its harbor wrecked. Its assembly plants and repair sheds useless. This is the wreckage the Germans have spread across Europe. Dunkirk. A devastated city strewn still with 50,000 mines. Dunkirk, a name that recalls heroic actions. Here, the Germans tried to conceal U-boat pens under the sign of the Red Cross. British ships sailed from England to bring freedom to the Channel Islands. Off the coast, the destroyer Bulldog anchored near to the German minesweeper, from which came a representative of the German command. Major General Heiner was instructed that only unconditional surrender would be accepted. Within a few minutes, he signed. The German flag is removed. The British white ensign flies in its place. After nearly five years of occupation, the Channel Islands are free. The 
Union Jack flies again over the only part of the British Isles ever to be occupied by the enemy. The Germans had fortified the Channel Islands as strongly as any place in Europe. Masses of equipment are surrendered, stores, guns, arms of every kind. General Heiner leaves his headquarters for the last time. And Vice Admiral Hofmeyer, the German Commander-in-Chief, leaves the island to become a British prisoner of war. The joy of the freed peoples of the Channel Islands was intense. To the liberating soldiers, too, the day was one of rejoicing. With the end of the war, one of the top British war secrets is now revealed. The secret of the oil and gasoline pipeline that fed the vast mechanized force across the channel. To begin with, the pipeline ran from Liverpool to the Channel Coast. But when the invasion was planned, it was realized something far larger was necessary if fuel was to arrive on the continent swiftly enough and in sufficient quantities. The first experiment was with a lead cable, seven and one half centimeters in diameter. It was covered with tar, and then with wire, and then with a second coating of tar. It was sunk in the Bristol Channel for a test. But for Normandy, it was not lead, it was steel they used. Six meter lengths of steel pipe were welded together. Now each pipe is a thousand meters long. It is as flexible as rubber. It is turned on giant reels. This is steel piping which is not swept away by tides and which resists the corrosive effect of salt water. With the invading armies, these ships went and from the enormous reels wound out the pipe into the sea, from England all the way to France. Invasion. And behind the troops, behind the trucks, the jeeps, the tanks, the half-tracks, came the fuel, the oil, and gasoline. And so, no matter how far they drove, there was never a fuel shortage for the Allied armies. Each of these drums weighed 1,600 tons and carried 70 miles of pipe. They were made hollow for buoyancy. Across France, across Belgium, and back near Dover, in what seemed to be golf clubs, ice cream factories, and innocent seaside villas, all camouflaged against German air attacks, were the pumping stations. The pumps worked, pumping the lifeblood of the armies from the great British system into the new system in liberated Europe. guarded against sabotage. The flow never stopped. Neither did the armies. With such a vast supply system behind them, the final defeat of the Wehrmacht was, from the first, inevitable. Inevitable. 